So welcome everyone uh, to this session on the 19th of March. How ethical is your clothing? I'm going to be your host today. My name is Natalia Clark Mill and I work for an organization called Aberdeen for a Fairer World. Uh, we're joined today with um, three uh, experts in their field, three guest speakers who will take us through some very interesting um, stories about fair trade and how um, it all fits together is how they, is Dr. Rachel Shanks going to talk, talk to us more about the, the framework that she's developed. So I'm just going to briefly um, set the scene and then pass over to our guest speakers. So Aberdeen for a Fairer World is one of five development education centres here in Scotland. We support teachers with their professional um, uh, professional learning and uh, we mainly cover sustainability topics and global uh, education, citizenship education. Other development education centres, as you can see on this map, uh, between us we cover the whole of Scotland. So if you're somewhere near if you're in an area other than Aberdeen City, Aberdeenshire, Murray, um, Orkney or Shetland, then don't worry, you will have a development education center near you covering your area. Okay, so also if you are um, a teacher and you are um, taking one of our sessions, you will know that you, you can be confident that you're, we are also looking after the GTC Scotland professional standards and that we'll be, make sure that what we talk about today is relevant for what you need to know. So today, um, our aims are really to look at the uh, cool schools sustainable supply chain and develop an understanding of how fair trade and organic, uh, organic cotton supports the global goals of responsible production and consumption, that's goal 12. And um, we'll then move on to uh, take you on a journey of cotton from seed to a final garment and really looking forward specifically to, to hear more about that and um, you will hear how fair trade protects workers and pushes the textile industry to be more sustainable which is what we're all um, hoping to do more of and finally you will hear from Dr Rachel Shanks from Aberdeen University about her work on situating the school clothing in the context of, of fairness sustainability and the work that she does with um, Scottish government about this. So I just want to give you a little, I'm, I'm bragging here, I want to give you a little um, introduction of who we have here today. So Catherine Newman, uh, she's an engagement and communication officer at uh, Scottish Fair Trade Forum. Catherine has a diploma in learning for sustainability and has a, a professional diploma in digital marketing and she's very passionate about fair trade. So all those th three things together, who better to speak to you about fair trade than Catherine tonight. And then we're going to hear from Andy Ashcroft, who is Cool School's founding partner. So Andy was an ex-British diplomat. Um, he's sitting here with me, so this is why I'm sort of turning this way. Mm -hmm. He's about to uh, speak to you shortly. Um, in Dominican Republic and Haiti. And shortly after that, he left the foreign office to start his second career. And he's also very passionate about building sustainable business that... Um, is in the in the uh, clothing industry and through fair trade and cotton uh, industry, make sure that the, the, the factory workers are um, treated fairly, the factory workers who make the clothes for cool schools. And then finally, we'll hear from Dr. Rachel Shanks, who's a senior lecturer at University of Aberdeen. And Dr. Shanks has conducted research, design and plan school clothing framework for action and has done some great work with um, working with the Scottish government on this. So without further ado, I'd love to sort of swap seats here with Andy and I'll pass on over to Catherine. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and that will let Catherine share hers. Okay, thank you very much for um, for having us this afternoon and for the introduction. So I am Catherine Newman from the Scottish Fair Trade Forum and I am joined by Andy Ashcroft. And as Natalia said, together we're going to be looking at the Cool Schools supply chain 
and how fair trade pushes the cotton industry to be more sustainable for both people and for planet. Um, so we're going to start just by considering the problem. Um, it's summarised really well in a, a short video on YouTube and I've got the links to pop in the chat after I've spoken um, about the International Fair Trade Charter. We're not going to have time to watch it this afternoon, but please do take time afterwards to watch through. But it says that the way we do business and trade isn't working. And we know that global poverty and climate change are on the increase. And this is especially the case for already marginalized or disadvantaged people. So for example, people who may live in extremely rural places, in many cases, relying on farming to make a living. And fair trade was started back in the 1960s as an alternative way of doing global business and trade that cares about people, especially the most marginalized people and cares about the planet. So the world is very aware of this problem and it's also why we're here today. Um, but according to the United Nations, by 2030, um, 575 million people will remain trapped in extreme poverty. So world leaders came together in 2015 and made a historic promise to secure the rights and well-being of everyone on a healthy, thriving planet when they adopted the 17 uh, Sustainable Development Goals. So the idea is that economic growth should create greater opportunities for everyone reduce inequalities, raise basic living standards, and should promote the sustainable management of our natural resources and ecosystems. But there is a lack of progress on these 17 targets. And specifically, fair trade aims to be a solution to some of these issues, particularly when it comes to goal number 12, responsible consumption and production. Andy, we're going to talk through how fair trade organic cotton, cool schools, and your suppliers are working towards sustainable development goal 12. But before moving on, we're going to have a look at the production of a standard non fair trade, non organic cotton t shirt by watching part of a TED Education short film called The Life Cycle of a T shirt by Angel Chang. Um, I should say, that um, the video is um, slightly um, outdated, but um, it's still relevant for us. And it's an American video. And we're just going to watch a little bit, but it's worth watching to the end in your own time. So. <laughs> Consider the classic white T-shirt. Annually, we sell and buy 2 billion t-shirts globally, making it one of the most common garments in the world. But how and where is the average t-shirt made, and what's its environmental impact? Clothing items can vary a lot, but a typical t-shirt begins its life on a farm in America, China, or India, where cotton seeds are sown, irrigated, and grown for the fluffy bowls they produce. Self-driving machines carefully harvest these puffs. An industrial cotton gin mechanically separates the fluffy bowls from the seeds, and the cotton lint is pressed into 225 kilogram bales. The cotton plants require a huge quantity of water and pesticides. 2,700 liters of water are needed to produce the average t-shirt, enough to fill more than 30 bathtubs. Meanwhile, cotton uses more insecticides and pesticides than any other crop in the world. These pollutants can be carcinogenic, harm the health of field workers, and damage surrounding ecosystems. Some t-shirts are made of organic cotton, grown without pesticides and insecticides, but organic cotton makes up less than 1% of the 22.7 million metric tons of cotton produced worldwide. Once the cotton bales leave the farm, textile mills ship them to a spinning facility, usually in China or India, where high-tech machines blend, card, comb, pull, 
stretch, and finally twist the cotton into snowy ropes of yarn called slivers. Then yarns are sent to the mill, where huge circular knitting machines weave them into sheets of rough grayish fabric, treated with heat and chemicals until they turn soft and white. Here, the fabric is dipped into commercial bleaches and azo dyes, which make up the vivid coloring in about 70% of textiles. Unfortunately, some of these contain cancer-causing cadmium, lead, chromium, and mercury. Other harmful compounds and chemicals can cause widespread contamination when released as toxic wastewater in rivers and oceans. Technologies are now so advanced in some countries that the entire process of growing and producing fabric barely touches a human hand. But only up until this point. After the finished cloth travels to factories, often in Bangladesh, China, India, or Turkey, human labor is still required to stitch them up into t-shirts. Intricate work that machines just can't do. This process has its own problems. Bangladesh, for example, which has surpassed China as the world's biggest exporter of cotton t-shirts, employs 4.5 million people in the t-shirt industry but they typically face poor conditions and low wages. After manufacture, all those t-shirts travel by ship, train, and truck to be sold in high-income countries, a process that gives cotton an enormous carbon footprint. Some countries produce their own clothing domestically, which cuts out this polluting stage. But generally, apparel production accounts for 10% of global carbon emissions. And it's escalating. Cheaper garments and the public's willingness to buy boosted global production from 1994 to 2014 by 400%. Okay, we're going to stop um, the video there, but please do feel free to watch the rest of that afterwards. Um, and I hope that we will go on to show how um, the cool school supply chain is different to what we've just been hearing about in this video. Okay, so we are now... We are now going to um, have a short quiz just to get you thinking. And to keep you on your toes, we do have a couple of questions a little bit later on. But to start with, if you could think about how many households around the world do you think could be involved in cotton production? And feel free to pop your answer in the chat or just to think for yourself. I'll give you a couple of seconds. And the answer is 100 million, so um, that's 100 million households directly in got, uh, engaged in cotton production in around about 85 countries around the world. That's a lot of people involved in making our clothes. And question two, what percentage of the world's cotton do you think is produced sustainably? Again, if you'd like to pop your answer in the chat, please do so. And the answer is coming up, and it is 13%. So that means there's a lot of room for improvement, and it's estimated that the environmental and social footprint of fair trade is five times lower than conventional cotton farming. So the fair trade standards have led to many environmental benefits, including a reduction of the use of harmful pesticides, and the introduction and strengthening of sustainable farming methods. Okay, question number three. There was a little hint in the film. But how many litres of water does it take to make one cotton t-shirt? Give you a couple of seconds. And the answer is 2,720. So cotton's dependency on water makes cotton growth and yields very vulnerable to water shortages, which occur as a result of higher temperatures and changes in the volumes and patterns of rainfall caused by climate change. 
And also, if you think about it, it's a lot of washer to throw away on fast fashion. And by the end of our session today, we'll see just how much goes into making our clothes. Andy, would you like to introduce Cool Schools? Thank you, Catherine. Good afternoon, everybody. Pleasure to be here in Aberdeen again. And um, nice to, to speak to you all. Um, yeah, Cool Schools. Well, as you can see from the slide, we're not very good at spelling, are we? Hopefully we're a bit better about um, uh, what we do, which is um, fair trade and fair trade uh, clothing. And it may surprise everybody to learn that in the UK every year, around about two billion pounds sterling is spent on school uniforms. So it's a massive industry and it's a very profits driven industry. Um, in my experience, I think it's fair to say that very few schools know where the uniform, where their uniforms come from whether it is made sustainably or whether the people who uh, make it are actually paid a fair price for it. Um, we set up this company um, many years ago now, back in 2010, believe it or not, uh, to do things differently. Cool Schools is the only UK fair trade certified supplier of school uniform that offers a core range of fair trade school uniform. And this means that the cotton farmers are paid fairly and all the factories involved in production are signed up to fair trade minimum standards. What does that actually mean? This means that they are audited to make sure, amongst other things, that there's no child labour enforced overtime. When we say enforced overtime, that means employees kind of almost forced to work, for example, the standard in the conventional industry, which is about a 12 hour working day, uh, or actually are subjected to bad uh, working conditions. And sadly, those conditions and that phenomenon of enforced overtime is still very much the norm in the clothing industry in uh, developing countries. Uh, our suppliers are based in India and Scotland has been our fastest growing market for Cool Schools Fair Trade School Uniform for some time, which is why I spend quite a lot of my time every year up in Scotland, which is not a problem for me. I love coming up here and zooming around schools um, because... Uh, one of the reasons I do that, apart from to talk to the schools about the possibility of introducing fair trade uniform as a, as a choice for their students and parents, but also we, we deliver free fair trade assemblies and class sessions with schools. So in other words, we like to share uh, the story of our chain, the people that work in our chain, both from the, from the cotton farmers point of view, but also the, the factory workers. So we kind of bring uh, the business alive, if you like, for the people that actually purchase and wear our, our uniform. I spent a week in India uh, back in November, a um, couple of weeks, sorry, a couple of weeks in India, November, December last year. And most of the photos you um, are going to see in the, in, in the slideshow today, including that one on the left as we look, look at, it, uh, at the screen, are from that visit. I spent eight fascinating uh, days living and working with the cotton farmers, picking the cotton as it was being harvested, because that's the main harvest time towards the end of each year. Uh, and I saw again for myself how fair trade supports the people through fair pr prices and decent working conditions and through totally organic cotton growing and, and through our eco factories, we're proud to be working at the UK end with one of the most kind of sustainable supply chains on the planet. And we, not only I, but the people that work in our company are here in the UK, which is not very many, um, but we, we regard that as an absolute uh, privilege. Um, and, and thank you for your interest in this topic. Uh, what we need is more young people, of course, uh, tomorrow's customers to be interested in, in sustainable supply chains and sustainable uh, living. So if we could move on to the next slide, please, Catherine. Yeah, great. Thanks for that, Andy. And can you tell us what difference a fair trade and organic polo shirt can make to people and planet? Yeah, thanks. So um, the polo shirts you can see there with the fair trade mark in the neck. And we also do um, cardigans and sweatshirts and hoodies. And they're all made of the, you know, the, this this mix of 50 percent fair trade organic cotton and 50 percent recycled polyester. For the people in the supply chain, the journey starts with the fair trade organic cotton farmers being paid fairly and receiving the important fair trade premium, which is an additional amount of money that we pay when we buy a fair trade product that those farmers spend 
on development projects that benefit their communities, for example, education, health, fresh water wells in remote farming villages. And I've visited many of those uh, remote farming villages in my time and something very simple and fairly low cost, like a water well in the middle of a village um, can, can have a huge impact on the well-being of that village and also on education, because guess what? The children no longer have to go fetch the water five or eight or ten miles away. They can go to school. Um, the people um, in and one other thing, sorry, to, to add on the fair trade premium, and this is a very important point. It is their decision, the decision of those fair trade um, cooperatives, those fair trade farming communities and fair trade communities. Um, farmers in different fair trade products around the world, they decide how they spend that money. So it's also very empowering at, at the same time. Um, going on to the factories, our factory workers are paid 25 to 30% above the national minimum wage in India. They work the same hours that we do in the UK. So remember, no enforced overtime, no 12 hour days. The fa our factories have a clinic have clinics and look after the health needs by offering private health insurance as well to the workers. There is a creche and a school adjoining the factory where some of the workers send their children for free. Um, free transport is also provided to and from the factory. And that is just a given. That is just what happens uh, in our factories. And the, and the workers don't have to pay for that transport. That's funded uh, by, the, by the factory. For the planet, the farmers grow their cotton 100% organically, and we'll, we'll talk about that a bit more later on. That means with no harmful pesticides or fertilizers at all on the farms, nothing, no fertilizers, no pesticides. This means that the farms are making a big contribution to uh, sustainability and um, helping to um, redress the balance of, of, of rapid, rapid climate change. Our principal factory uses solar power and 90% of the waste is recycled. So the clothes are made in the most sustainable way possible. Even the clothing labels and swing tickets are made from recycled cotton. All the factories in the supply chain. So that's, um, uh, that's five use sustainably friendly processing techniques. Five factories altogether. And all of those factory, factories use uh, sustainable processing techniques. Um, from the planting of the uh, the seed to the final factory in the process, it takes about one year altogether. If we could move on to the next slide, um, please, Catherine. Yeah, so as we look at that slide, um, so, so that entire process, so from the point at which the farmers plow their fields and they plant their seeds to the time which we receive the garments here in the UK, that can, can take anything between nine and 12 months. So it's a very, very long uh, supply chain. Um, and and um, just for clarification, a supply chain, as we see in this slide, is like a network of all of the people, organizations, resources, activity, activities and technology involved in the creation of the sale of a product. So sometimes that, it, that um, term can be a bit confusing, but that's basically what it is. It's, it's the, net, the whole network all put together involved in the creation and sale of a product. So, so we are also obviously at this end at Cool Schools, as we receive garments and we sell them on to our customers, um, we are part of uh, the supply chain. Um, in this slide, we can see five different factories involved in being part of a fair trade certified supply chain. And that helps to ensure that the many people who produce the clothing, the many thousands of farmers and the thousands of people who work in the factories are paid and treated fairly. The cotton growing and clothes making is being as kind to the planet as well as it possibly can be. This is what fair trade certification is all about. A sustainable supply chain. If we could move on to the next slide, please, Catherine. Yeah, Andy, so you mentioned that these are your photos from India. So what are we seeing here? Okay, so onto the uh, cotton fields and the cotton farming communities. So, so uh, the, the photo on the left shows a typical organic cotton field. You can see uh, in the middle of that photo, uh, the lines of cotton. So, so predominantly on the farm, this is, a, this is a cotton, an organic cotton producing a farm. But in between the lines of cotton, you can see those plants with the yellow flowers. So those are lentils uh, being grown. And uh, part of the process of converting our 
Um, uh, we work with an organization, as you can see on the slide there, called Checkno Organic. And that's an umbrella, uh, what we call not-for-profit organization that works with over now 30,000 um, uh, farming families, cotton farming families across four different states of India. And Chetna works with conventional co cotton farmers. In, it, it kind of almost embraces villages kind of one at a time and gradually converts all of the conventional cotton farmers in those villages to organic uh, cotton farming. And that process, believe it or not, takes three years. It takes three years to rid the soil of all the poison of years and years of pesticides, harmful pesticides and fertilizers and so on. And Chetna also works with those cotton farmers on something called intercropping, which means that they grow between the lines of cotton, they grow their own food so they can be self-sustaining. They can sell their cotton on fair trade terms, but they can also they also grow their own food. There you see it in action in that slide on the left. So um, they can be self-sustaining in their food. So, of course, one of the staple Indian dishes is dal made with lentils. And there you see the lentils growing in that organic on that organic cotton farm. Um, so uh, on, on the second photo, you see something called the yellow sticky trap. And that's a yellow piece of board that a special organic gum is applied to. This attracts some of the in insects that are harmful to the plants. This is used instead of harmful pesticides, for example, but used as part of crop spraying, which uses, as we've seen in the film, vast amounts of water. Going back to the animation of a life cycle of a T-shirt, the difference is that these organic cotton fields are rain fed. They are not using excessive amounts of water. And there are all sorts of other things, as you might imagine, that farmers are taught to do as organic cotton farmers to protect the plants in an organic way. So pheromone traps, solar, solar, pa solar panel traps to, ex um, to attract the insects. Also, and this is crucial uh, when you're running an organic cotton farm, you, um, you, 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 uh, you actually produce your own liquid pesticides and fertilizers. And um, you don't have to hold your noses here, but I certainly had to hold my nose when I was in India when I looked into one of these giant barrels because over uh, several months before the harvesting season, um, uh, they spray the plants with uh, a heady mix of cow dung and pea dung, uh, cow dung and goat dung mixed with cow pea and goat pea. And they put toxic leaves into, the, uh, into this mixture um, uh, which acts as a, a pesticide to keep the harmful pests away and um, various other things that they throw in as well uh, that acts as a fertilizer. It's a wonderful thing to behold. And they, they use one part of that heady, smelly mixture uh, to five parts water. And then they, and then they put a tank on their back and they, and they spray and they spray the plants with it. And it's incredibly, incredibly effective. Um, the next photo, so the third from the left, um, shows daughters of cotton farmers who report improved education in their villages as a result of the fair trade premium. And the fourth photo is a cotton storage facility. It doesn't look like a, an incredibly, um, you know, um, impressive building, if you like. Uh, but this cotton storage facility in this village of, of Aliguda, Aliguda has about 35 cotton farmers. The, the farm on the far left there is one of the Aliguda farms that I visited whilst I was there. And that cotton storage facility is used um, for the three months of the harvest, not surprisingly, to store the cotton. And that saves the cotton farmers where the vast majority of cotton, and there are millions of them, by the way, cotton farmers in India. Um, if there's no uh, cotton storage facility in the village, they will have to store the cotton, as most of them do, in their front room. OK, so they have a gradually increasing pile over that two to three months of cotton in their front room. So so that um, so that cotton storage facility is uh, is used, obviously, to full effect during uh, the cotton harvest. They they farm, for example, about three metric tons of cotton in Aliguda uh, every year, but also other than the times when when everything is full on in the village and they're harvesting the cotton, that um, cotton storage facility acts as a community facility where they host, um, you know, community events. And, and so when I when I arrived there, 
they just had Diwali, for example, and um, and they'd had various parties in in, in the uh, in the in the storage facility. So it's like a, like a village hall, if you like. And beyond that, they also conduct technical training for the cotton farmers in that um, cotton storage facility, not only for the cotton farmers in that village, but also for cotton farmers in in the in the neighbouring um, villages as well. So that very simple cotton storage facility paid for by the fair trade premium has become a real community hub and it's um it's wonderful to see it in in action um so i think we're about ready to to move through the process now the the supply chain um and, and the factory chain and now we're on to uh, ginning which is the very first factory in the process the cotton is cleaned in giant sieves if you like to get rid of the impurities like dead bugs live bugs and dirt Import, importantly, too, and you can see these in the middle slide there, um, the, the ginning process, the sieving process, if, if you like, of the of the raw cotton um, sifts out the, the cotton seeds and the good seeds are kept for next year's harvest. Um, the sifted cotton is then uh, sent on to the spinning factory. But I think you've got a slide to show between this and the spinning factory, haven't you, Catherine? Yeah. So I, I was going to ask you, Andy, so yeah, it just looks so soft and, and you obviously took the chance to have a, a jump into that pile. Well, it's quite funny because I was with um, the CEO, the chief executive of our, of our factory chain, Ranga, on, on the day and, and Ranga likes a bit of fun. And I was actually dying to do that, to jump into this giant mountain of cotton. So so Ranga did it. So I thought, well, you know, in for a penny. So, yeah, it, it was uh, it's, it's great fun. And this is really is a cotton mountain. Um, yeah, I think we'd all do the same, Andy. Uh, so, there you go. <laughs> moving on to spinning and knitting. Yeah. So um, so the giant, as, as we've seen, I won't spend uh, too much time on the spinning and knitting because we, we, we've seen um, in the film what happens. So basically, these giant uh, bales arrive from the ginning factory. The, the, the cotton fibers are combed, aerated and gradually uh, finally twisted together. It goes from being similar to to the kind of, kind of almost like fair trade organic cotton rope, if you like, which you can see in the in the middle of in the middle photo there, to to yarn or thread, and then it's beginning on the on the left there. So then it's beginning to look a bit more like we might recognise thread to be in you know sewing boxes at home or, or whatever. Um, and then and then um, in in the photo on the right, we can see the yarn has now gone from the spinning factory to the knitting factory. And it never ceases to amaze me. I visited a knitting factory again when I was in India this last time. And um, these, these machines are incredibly sophisticated. Um, and um, what you see, if you look really, really closely at that slide, you, you can see at that photo, you can see the threads coming down. And, and what you've got is you've got fair trade organic cotton uh, threads, yarn coming down. And then in between the fair trade organic cotton yarn, you've got threads of, um, of recycled polyester. So so made from plastic bottles. So uh, and, you know, a good few years ago now, when that technology started to be developed, um, it you know, the, the, the fabric that was produced was actually quite harsh and it didn't wash well and so on and so forth. But over recent years, the technology has been obviously developed. And now, if you, you know, I don't want to advertise our, our, our garments too much, but if you, if, you, if, you, if you feel the softness uh, and the durability and the washability of the garments, it's very difficult to believe that they're actually made with half with recycled uh, plastic, but obviously um, they are. Yeah. So, Thanks, Andy. So I've um, been waiting for this slide because earlier in the animation, we heard about um, the pollution from waste water into local um, water sources. So what happens here differently? OK, so the fabric arrives at the dyeing factory and, and is this light brown, what we call a greyish colour. So, 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 so virgin fabric, if you like, before it's been dyed is, is a greyish colour. It's inspected for flaws, which you see in the middle photo there. You see the guide going through through the fabric. So like a final check, if you like. And... The photo on the right shows the giant dyeing vats, and for cool schools, the colours are 
are used uh, obviously those found predominantly in school uniforms the core colors if you like so your royal blues your navy blues your reds your bottle greens and 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 so on and what makes this factory different to the factories mentioned in the animation in the film is that the waste water goes to effluent treatment plants and to reverse osmosis. So, so the dyeing factory here, for example, has its own reverse osmosis plant. So those are um, so so these are employed as an advanced treatment technology for the treatment and reuse of textile and dyeing waste water. So there's total water recycling going on in this dyeing factory. So no effluent going into local rivers or lakes or, or, or wherever. Some of the certifications held by the factory are a ZDHC certificate, which is zero discharge of harmful chemicals certificate. And they're members of the HIG index, which measures social and environmental, in, environmental impacts in the apparel industry. And they do detox dyeing to eliminate, to eliminate hazardous uh, chemicals. So if you like, um, the dyeing factories used by cool, cool, cool schools are the complete opposite of the factories seen in the animation earlier. Okay, and on to the cut, make and trim factory. Okay, so um, so that that those are photos again uh, taken by me on this latest trip to India in November, December of last year. And at the CMT factory, as the acronym is, 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 is widely known, uh, the workers' children are able to go to the school beside the factory, partially funded by the Indian government and partially funded by the, uh, by the factory. So there's good participation going on there between our factory and, and the government. There's also a free creche. There's also, um, and this is so important, the creche and also the local school, as 65% of the workers in the factory are single mums. Due to local cultural barriers, they would otherwise be unable to find work in that region. So with this provision, it is, it is really a lifeline for those women. They're wonderful, happy people. I can vouch for that because I, I saw and talked to many of them last November and December. And I, I visited some of their homes. I had the great privilege of being able to go, to go home with a few of the, the ladies who lived in the village uh, nearby. Um, and they're also genuinely happy in their work. And you can almost, I've visited... As you can imagine, doing this visit, uh, doing this, um, um, running this business for 14 years, um, we used to manufacture in Mauritius. Um, nowadays, we manufacture everything in India. So I've visited many factories in my time, uh, some fair trade license, mostly fair trade licensed factory factories, but also conventional factories, fair trades that are factories that are not fair trade licensed and. I can honestly say you notice a palpable difference. You can almost tell a happy factory when you step through the doors. And, um, and I can certainly uh, vouch for, um, you know, the, the, um, the well-being of the people in our, in our factories, in, 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 in our fair trade license factories in, in India. The workers work an eight-hour day, have, as I said earlier, free transport to and from work. Um, you might have heard, you know, those listening might have heard of a sweat shop when describing some factories that make clothes. Well, the factories used in this supply chain, again, are the complete opposite is what, what is often associated with um, a sweatshop. Yeah. Great. Okay, and on to transport, Andy. Okay, so the finished clothes, our finished clothes are packed in biodegradable bags and cartons and are taken by road from Tirupur in India to Chennai. They are then shipped through the Suez Canal, taking normally between 25 to 30 days. But if you've all been, uh, as I'm sure you have been following the news recently, um, the problems in the Red Sea, the security problems continue uh, for commercial shipping. So that journey is now taking um, 10 to, to, to 10 days to two weeks longer. And of course, that makes it more costly, the journey more costly and the carbon emissions are, are greater. So obviously we want, as every other clothing factory on the planet, every other clothing importer on the planet, um, wants, um, wants, wants those um, Red Sea problems to, uh, to, to stop. Um, yeah, so, so yeah, it is a carbon footprint, um, but as you can see from, you know, the organic cotton growing and what we do in our factories, you know, the eco, the recycling of water, what we do in our dyeing factories, you know, we, we, we try and reverse that process as much as possible, but there is there is no alternative to, to obviously putting those garments on a, on a ship. 
and shipping them over here to the UK. Yeah, and then it's it's over to us um, because we can make a big difference to the carbon footprint of a clothing item as well um, by perhaps washing it less or washing it at lower temperatures, uh, line drying clothes instead of tumble drying, repairing garments and reusing and handing down garments too. And on this slide, we see Sustainable Development Goal 12 alongside the Fair Trade Mark and the World Fair Trade Organization um, uh, Guaranteed Fair Trade logo. Um, so if we can, when we are shopping, if we can bear in mind the Sustainable Development Goal 12, and not just when we're buying cotton, but for everything, we um, need to ask ourselves if we need it, and how many times we will wear it or use it? And has the product been made sustainably with people and planet in mind? So does it have any labels such as fair trade um, to tell me that it's sustainable? Am I part of the solution or of the problem? And for me, those are good starting points in thinking about being a responsible consumer. Andy, what do you think? Yeah, I think um, that there's often we we can do in many ways we we can do more than more than we think as as consumers of the future and um, you know we can start um, we we can start by looking at the labels and um, if those labels don't tell you anything apart from potentially where the, uh, the country from which the garment has been made um, then we we can question we can ask you know we can ask managers of of clothing chains and managers of shops you know where. Where the garment uh, comes from, we can ask. You know, with with different products that we buy in supermarkets, we can always be inquisitive and try and find out where where things come from, where things are made. You know, in in our industry, in the clothing industry, the vast majority of companies, particularly fast fashion companies, are very very reluctant to to tell people where their factories are and you know how many hours a, a a day their workers work what they get paid and so on and so forth and that's because often they don't know um you know and they don't even know for example where they're subcontracting sub their work to where the you know and there are so many stories unfortunately of um uh, clothing supply chains where where workers are being exploited and where the brands here you know in the UK or in Europe or in the US or, or wherever have no idea and, and we feel that if we're, as we are, we're a small fair trade company, and if we can make these efforts to go and visit the people, you know, go, go and be with the cotton farmers that produce the cotton, and we can understand and get to know the way our factories work, the way our factory managers treat their workers, and we can speak to the workers independently of the factory managers to make sure that what the factory managers are telling us about their treatment of the workers is actually what happens, then we feel that more of the big brands should make those sorts of efforts and it can and it all starts really with with consumers asking questions so i would encourage everybody to ask those sorts of questions great and here are our final um surprise questions to keep everybody on their toes so um what percentage of the world's clothing is made from cotton And I'll give you a couple of seconds. And the answer is 70%. And what percentage of that cotton is certified fair trade? Andy, do you know the answer? <laughs> yeah, this is the, always the one that makes me cry, Catherine, because it's less than 1%, sadly. Yeah. Okay. So um, a good place to start when finding out um, a bit more about fair trade is to Google the 10 principles of fair trade and have a read through those. Some other suggested follow on activities would be to, to go back and watch the, um, the animation from the International Fair Trade Charter. And I'll put the link in the chat shortly, along with the, the full uh, life cycle of a t-shirt uh, animation and to contact cool schools for lesson plans, perhaps create a poster about um, the benefits of having a fair trade cotton uniform. And there's also an ongoing campaign from an organization called Transform Trade, 
where they are asking you to ask your MP to support a fashion watchdog in the UK. And again, that link will be in the chat in a second. And here is our contact information, uh, should you like to follow up with us afterwards. And I think that's all from us, Andy. Yeah, I just I just wanted to say to end on a very positive note, Catherine. I mentioned earlier that um, that uh, I think I mentioned that we that we now supply over sixty schools in Scotland, and um, getting on for a dozen and a half schools now we supply in Aberdeen and Aberdeenshire, and um, in the context, uh, you know, we're we're a, we're a company that's based down in in Southampton in Hampshire and beyond the Hampshire borders. Um, our fastest growing market at the moment is Aberdeenshire and Aberdeenshire schools. So I'm up in Scotland this 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 time this week for one week, and three of those five days are here in Aberdeen, Aberdeenshire, and uh, for the next um, uh, three days I'll be visiting um, five schools altogether, running assemblies and class sessions and and so on and so forth. And um, so uh, I'm I'm visiting the area increasingly frequently. I'm visiting Scotland increasingly frequently. So if any schools would like to hear more from us, if they would like a cool schools visit. Um, then very happy to hear from you and we'd, we'd love to engage with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. A quick swap. So that was fascinating. Thank you so much for um, sharing all the knowledge and experience and the visit. To India with us. Thanks so much. So um, we, I would like to welcome um, Dr. Shanks to now um, feel free to share the, her screen and um, tell us a bit more about what you've been um, busy doing. Great. Can you see that? You can maybe give me a thumbs up. Yes. Yeah, great. Thanks. Hi everyone. So my name is Rachel Shanks and I work at the School of Education at the University of Aberdeen and I've been researching school uniform for the last five years, partly with students at the university and partly with colleagues um, at other universities. And I'm sort of trying to, 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 to encourage people to look at school uniform holistically. So in terms of making school uniform ethical, as well as thinking about um, fair trade, I think it's also important to think about, um, is it affordable? Is it comfortable and comfortable in terms of equality, diversity and inclusion, but maybe a bit more than that as well, and in terms of sustainability. So I think, you know, Andy and, and Catherine have, have talked um, a bit and, and shown you a bit about in terms of sustainability, um, in terms of water use and fertilizers on um, cotton that's made for school uniform. So what I thought I would concentrate on is just in terms of affordability and um, comfort or, you know, equality, diversity and inclusion. So in terms of affordability, um, I've used that term rather than cost um, because obviously it, it, in a sense it doesn't matter how much the uniform costs as long as everyone can afford it but the difficulty we, we can have is that if there are a lot of items are required um, by a school or encouraged uh, people are encouraged to have as part of their of what they wear or what they bring to school um, for, for classroom activities and for PE for physical education, um, that can be difficult if people are either receiving the school clothing grant, eligible for the school clothing grant, but don't know about it, or are just above the level of being in receipt of the school clothing grant. So at the minute, the national minimum in Scotland, in primary school, uh, the school clothing grant is £120 a year, and for secondary school, it's £150 a year. Some local authorities pay more than that, but uh, the majority, 18 of the 32 local authorities, um, the, it's, it's the minimum, it's 120 and 150. Um, some local authorities, a small number, pay uh, that clothing grant for, for nursery age children, but, but very few. So if we think about um, families living in poverty or, um, can receive either 120 or 150 pounds for school uniform that's meant to cover all the clothes and shoes 
everything that's needed to go to school. You can see how maybe it's difficult for uh, a lot uh, if a lot of items are asked for spec that are particular to school and that are needed as part of the school uniform. So I've been working, so this, I should have mentioned, this diagram has come out of work that I've been doing with um, David Innes of Aberdeen for a Fairer World, uh, Kirsty Campbell from Child Poverty Action Group, Mark Irwin and uh, Maxine Jolly of uh, Education Scotland. So we've been sort of discussing all the things and, and what, what could go together to think about um, sort of ethical school uniform all together. And as well as another way to make school uniform affordable, thinking about the cost of the items, you know, how much clothing grant is given, also thinking about obviously about pre-loved school uniform. So how can we reuse um, school uniform as much as possible before recycling it? And obviously that makes it more sustainable as well. So rather than items being worn by just one child or being used in, in one family, how many times can we reuse um, those items? And obviously the better quality the items are, the more they can be reused. So I'm sure that, you know, the because I've you know seen the cool school items. So things similar to that, you know, if they're really well made, obviously can be reused more often. So one uh, secondary school in Scotland, what they do with their blazers is that they people, it's a deposit scheme. And people hand them back, get a bigger size and uh, they, they keep reusing the blazers for as long as possible um, so that they have as much use um, and that makes it uh, more sustainable rather than things being used just once, maybe even for just one year because somebody's grown that and more and more schools are doing that with having rails maybe at the front of the school with pre-loved, pre-owned items that people can take and then and reuse. So that obviously also makes school uniform more affordable. Um, in terms of equality, diversity, and inclusion, um, I've also thought of that in terms of uh, being comfortable. And that is really so that it covers everything. Everyone wants to be comfortable, you know, at school. Um, so that could be in terms of the fabric, uh, people preferring cotton rather than uh, synthetic fibers. Um, people being able to, uh, you know, children being able to, to having fine motor skills that it's easier maybe if there aren't buttons and there aren't zips on the clothing, uh, that makes them more comfortable because they know they can get changed for PE. Um, it's also things in terms of gender. So that might be with, with girls, making sure that school uniform policies don't talk about um, girls, uh, thinking about their modesty and a sense of decency in terms of their skirt length. Um, and also in terms of making sure that school uniform policy is inclusive in terms of transgender people. So not having a gendered school uniform policy of this is what boys wear, this is what girls wear, just having a policy of this is, this is the school uniform and people wear whichever items they want to wear. Also in terms of race and religion, um, you know, schools, can be you know careful in terms of what they're requiring people um, to wear for, for uniform. And you might wonder why on this uh, sort of the, the third for equality, diversity and inclusion, why is there a bicycle? Well, the reason why there's a bicycle is that there's more and more research being done to show that girls are doing less physical activity during the school day because of, of skirt, school skirts and dresses. Because of the traditional school uniform that a lot of girls wear, they're actually, um, it's, it's been calculated, it's you know, been measured in terms of uh, fitness uh, research, looking at um, school age girls, that they're doing less exercise on the way to school and then they're doing less uh, physical activity during the school day. So that's why um, the bicycle is there. And we've also got the little scroll because in July, obviously, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child is coming into force in Scotland. And uh, Article 12 of that is about participation of uh, you know, children and young people in decisions that affect them. And obviously, what they're wearing to school affects them. So all these issues to do with comfort, equality, inclusion, uh, young people could be discussing uh, with their schools. So those are just some of the issues, really, just how we could make the school uniform more ethical by involving young people, 
by making sure it can be reused. And, and I've, as we've heard all, already, you know, from uh, cool schools about how also thinking about where where is it being sourced? You know, who, who's who's making who's making the uniform? Um, and then is it fit for purpose? Is it is it what the young people uh, find comfortable? Okay, so I'll hand back to you, Natalia.